right. Thank you so much for being with us today. This is Get on the Bus presented by IMAVL and Salvage Station. We're sitting here with Jackie Vincent from Austin, Texas. So excited to have you on today, Jackie. So, uh, yeah, high five for sure. So you guys uh, did Echo Sessions today. Yes, it's been a crazy, like, three days, man. So I'm, I might look a little fried, me and my manager. We might be a little fried. <laughs> but but we just acquired done. a driver now and a merch lady and just more help today she she had met us in atlanta yesterday and and so it's been a little bit better but we've done two overnight drives so it's like yikes man when your body expects to be in a bed but you're in a car seat it's crazy yeah <laughs> yeah and you do a lot it's of really that. hard you're like i'm dying <laughs> it's crazy and then you like wake yourself up because you like like fell forward or maybe like the driver like went er, a little bit and it's yeah. like damn man it's hard touring's hard so, but you've been on tour pretty much for a minute now, right? You just came back from Europe. Yes, I've been on tour since June 6th. Okay, so yeah, and so we're in July, and you've still got yes. quite a few dates left, it looks like, on the back end I here. will not be really, really home until September 10th. September 10th. I'll be home for like maybe three days in a row. I just, uh, my gigs in San Francisco just got canceled because the venue's uh, suffering flooding damage. Oh. Yeah, their upstairs neighbor kind of screwed them over. Oh, that sucks. So uh, they're working on that, and they can't, the equipment got damaged, and, you know, they can't get it all restored by August. It's, they only have a month, and that's a lot of money. Equipment's very expensive. And so it was just an unfortunate situation, and my San Francisco gigs were canceled, so now I have, like, three days home. But that's just, like, three days. Yeah, so that's it's just, like, like you catch your, your breath. Eyes. Yeah. That's, that's, like, a weekend off from work, because it's, like, yeah. it goes by, like, and then, and then it's like You're all right the way until the September 10th. Yeah. Man, so just killing it all over the place. It's great. I'm going to spend those three days in the studio. I'm going to spend one day off. So let's talk about the studio, though, because you I'm talk about the studio, the studio a lot uh, in a lot of yes. your interviews, and it seems like um, maybe more than, than anything else, the process in the studio is what really affects your, your music. You know, it seems like you, you don't go in there with a lot of expectations, and it seems like you expect your things to morph and change when you're in there how much is that song. a part of your creative process well it depends on the song some songs i completely write and arrange from beginning to end and then i go into the studio and we just pull the parts off the sampler like what i mean by that is i use a sampler mm -hmm. and i record the parts into the sampler because the sampler lets me have 16 individual tracks okay and then i put those individual tracks into sequence and so i can have like a whole track dedicated to just the kick drum or just the guitar part or just the bass part and so I sit at home for days or weeks or months, now it's been months, um, putting together these parts for the song. I'm arranging the song. Instead of having a drummer come up with the beat, I'm putting a kick and a snare and a hi-hat and sequencing it and using that as the beat. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so um, sometimes I go in with the song totally arranged and we just pull the parts off the sampler and then I'll bring in a real drummer and I'll be like, hey, uh, play play this beat but put your spin on it yeah and, and they just go in Rodney it's usually Rodney yeah sometimes it's somebody else but it's usually Rodney and he just goes in and puts his Rodney spin on it and we'll be done with the song in, in a day okay. we could do two songs in a day at that, at that rate if I've already completely arranged it yeah <laughs> not every time have I already completely arranged it sometimes it's a new song and I haven't had time I have the parts in mind, but I've not actually recorded them into a sampler and we're not just like pulling all the parts that I already recorded. Yeah. You know, so sometimes it takes two days. Does it become more collaborative at that point? Yes. That's when the producer I work with, his name is Frenchie. Um, that's when we start to have like really fun conversations about what we want to do with the song. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's a lot of the reason why Joy sounded so good because uh, I was more open to that. I was more open to people helping me with the arrangements. And with Joy, you released each of those songs as a single, basically. Oh, right? only seven of them. Only seven of them. Yeah. And then came out with the album. And the album is, it's such an eclectic selection of songs. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I love about it is there's no pigeonholing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but the one thing that really jumps out to me is this thing you do where you kind of match your lead guitar to your voice. Yes. Um, and... Did, did that inspiration... I've never heard anyone else do it. So I guess to Some me... Some people do it my in question is, pieces. Yeah. George Benson does it. He'll play half the guitar solo, and then he'll be like... Bee -bee 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 -bee. Some people do it on the piano, too. Yeah. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, he'll sing the chorus line, and he'll play the rhythm part. 
and then he'll go but then he'll go back to doing the rhythm part nobody ever really does it from beginning to end yeah. like it's like every time you hear my voice you simultaneously hear the guitar and uh, the reason why I want to do that is because nobody does it yeah and I want it to be uh, I want it to become a part of my voice I think that there are certain frequencies missing in my voice that make make it not as rich as I want it to be hmm. and those frequencies I find in the guitar so mixing the frequencies that are naturally in my voice with the wider range of availability of frequencies on the guitar yeah. makes my voice sound really full. And it also makes the melody really punch you in the face. And the melody is the most important part of the song. So um, it's, uh, it's just to support the melodies. I mean, the, the Beatles like quadrupled their vocals constantly. Yeah. They they really really cared about that shit. They would you would never catch just one of them singing alone. Every now and then, maybe on Blackbird. Yeah. But like if the band was playing, they everybody singing. is singing in unison. For sure. And the reason why is because it sounds thicker, it's especially thicker. on recordings, because their recording equipment wasn't as good, and so they had to like come at it with a thicker sound. They couldn't like bring that out afterwards like we can, and so. Uh, they were obsessed with doubling and tripling and quadrupling their melodies as well. So yeah, and those melodies are not going anywhere. Not Everybody going anywhere. Is, no one's ever going to forget those melodies. So, <laughs> so some other melodies that are not going anywhere that have been a big part of your, uh, at least and from what I've read, and your uh, growth as a musician is at least as a child was Disney melodies. Yes, Disney's um, a big deal, man. And and that got me, I looked at some of the Disney melodies you said you liked, and I saw kind of a theme, and it made me start thinking about Elton John. Yeah. And then I couldn't unhear Elton John a little bit in some of your music. Oh, really? Do you consider Elton John to be an influence? I would not be surprised. He <laughs> wrote a lot of the songs off The Lion King, and he also has written a lot of songs for other people. Mm -hmm. um, he, his sound is, like, entrenched in our culture. Yeah. So, just like Max Martin. And you started playing classical piano originally, right, as a child. Yes. And, and so there's a couple different versions of this I've read, and I, I'd like to go with the legendary one, so please support it if that is it. The, the legendary version of the story that I've heard is that you were walking down the street and you were freezing cold in Boston, and you were so sick of being cold, and you walked into a bar and there was somebody ripping a blues guitar and you were like screw it i gotta go buy a guitar and learn how to play it so i can actually express how i feel about this weather is that <laughs> is that really how this happened um yes except for trade the bar out for a cafeteria concert okay okay it was a cafeteria concert in the basement of my dorm building <laughs> i never left that dorm building i would only leave that dorm building to cross the street to get into another building there was only like three or four locations i would roam to outside of my dorm okay um, and it was only because those were the only locations that I could get to inside. <laughs> so, like, whenever I felt like I needed to stretch my legs and go on a walk, I would run the three blocks to the Prudential Center. The Prudential Center stretches, like, 17 blocks. <laughs> it's like a whole subway station. So it's this giant mall, and I used to just walk with my friends around the Prudential Center, and that's what we would have to do for fun. Oh. <laughs> because that was how bad the weather was. That was what we did for fun. But it, it, it brought you to the guitar. Yeah, it was just like, man, the ceiling was so low for like things to do because it's just like the weather was just impossible for like six months out of the year. You know some people love that weather. Yeah, well, those people maybe like staying inside all the time. <laughs> I'm not one of those people who like staying inside all the time, so I can't like that weather. It's not possible. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Plus, I'm used to the sun. If it was like that, but it was sunny like Colorado, I'd be okay with it. At least the sun comes out. Yeah. You know, at least I don't like. Colorado is super sunny. I don't lose my skin color. I lost my skin color. It was in crazy. Boston, yeah, yeah, you should see my Berkeley ID picture. I'll try and get that for you. It's That'd be crazy. Great. You're darker than I was at Berkeley. Because <laughs> you've been in this North Carolina sun, man. I'm serious. This is a strong sun here. It's nice. It's a good so sun. You're here. darker than I was at Berkeley. All right. I am not kidding. Well, I mean, I've been, I've been working outside all summer, so I'm darker Still, than normal. Though. But... Still, though. Like, you were darker than me. <laughs> and then when I was there, if I would have put my arm next to your arm, I would have been like pale. So I grew up in upstate New York, so, so I'm you familiar understand. with that weather. And you'll notice I don't live in upstate New York anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I can't take it. Once you once you experience the sun, you can't leave it, man. So let's talk about some other influences, though, right? Um, your first concert was 
the Backstreet, the Backstreet Boys. Boys. That's that's. Uh... Uh, it was a great concert. There was fire. There was. I was eight. There yeah. was fire. They like were suspended, flying in the air and shit. One of them was only like eight feet above me. I was like, whoa. It was cool. But, like, the Backstreet Boys... That, That's you know, Max Martin. Yeah. And it's putting on a show, right? Like, I saw Slightly Stupid here recently. And it's just, on a just a different heck category. Of a show too. It is a different category. It's just thing. a different category of, like, music and concert. It's, like, more... It's about more than the music. Yeah. It's Some some concerts are just about the music. Like, Stevie Wonder's concert is just about the music. It, but the music is so fucking phenomenal. <laughs> and the players on stage... Sorry, excuse my French. That's all right. so incredible that... It has to be only about the music because it's like amazing, but some sometimes it's not only about the music. Sometimes like the person's a really good dancer. Yeah. And that's another art form that is amazing. So if the person's a really good dancer, the music has to assist in that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, um, yeah. Sometimes it's only about the music, and sometimes it's about the show. And how? Where do you fall in that kind of on a scale of I, zero to a hundred? I can only pull off. It being only about the music. Okay. I don't have the Not money. even the comedy? Not even the stage banter? Well, that's to support the music. <laughs> I tell... The stories I design the stage banter around are the stories of the songs. Yeah. And then I just sing the songs, and then I tell the stories, and then I sing the songs. And so it's really about, I guess, my story and about the music. And, um... But the music is most of it because I wouldn't be good without it. I could do a show without stage banner; it'd be a great show. If I did a show without music but only did stage banner, like I'm not a comedian. <laughs> like I can't do that shit. I'm not a speaker. The music is is everything. That's like eighty percent of the show, and then twenty percent of it is me like expressing myself. And um, but you do such a great job of expressing yourself through <laughs> your lyrics, and um, yeah, you tackle some interesting topics and. Some topics that I, I don't know how you would associate them with, but even topics of love and friendship and yeah. the intermingling of those. There's a song you have that, that just blew my mind when I heard it about that. Yeah. Um, and then you also come at a lot of these 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 concepts from there's a positive vibe, but you're never that never seems naive. Um, yeah. So just how do you, observations. Yeah. How do you go about with your songwriting? Like, is it is it just kind of like are you scribbling stuff all day? Does it kind of come to you all at once? Actually, I. Uh, Sometimes I just get hook words in my brain. Yeah. Like a, I thought, like a, a hook line that I thought of a few years ago was see you in the next life. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like that was really hooky. And I was like, I feel like I could also come up with a cool melody to accompany it. So then I was like, well, what would the rest of the song be about if it was, if this, this line is see you in the next life? It's like, okay, so then what's the song about? And so then I start thinking about what that could mean. Hmm. And then I just write down a bunch of shit about what that could mean. And it doesn't make any sense. And my, like, 10th grade writing teacher, like, you know, like, English class or whatever, um, she called it madman writing, where you go in and you just write. What was her name? I don't remember. Oh. I don't remember anything about high school. Except for madman writing. I only remember, like, two teachers. Three teachers. <laughs> and one was my second grade teacher. One was my, like... 12th grade English teacher and one was my like 10th grade Spanish Well, let's teacher. name them. They, let's name them. Well, Mrs. Walker in second grade. Okay. She's my favorite teacher. We both loved Angela Weber's Evita. Okay. And uh, she lives across the street from the school. Still, I still drop CDs off at her house whenever <laughs> I come out with a new CD. I'm serious. I'm going to, I haven't dropped off the new CD. I'm going to go drop it off to Mrs. Walker's house. She when still you have lives that three there. days. When you have that three days. It's August. I hope she's still around in August. <laughs> that was a while ago. So, um, and then, uh, my like tenth grade Spanish teacher, Mrs. Johnson. I thought she was really, really nice. And then uh, my twelfth grade English teacher, Mr. Christan. He was awesome. Those are the only three teachers aren't. <laughs> yeah, but that's great. That's like three people that influenced your life and your. Yeah. Well, you the other out. ones influenced me, just not as much as those ones. Did, so <laughs> I don't remember their names. But anyway, she said, "Madman writing. You go and you just write. It doesn't even have to make sense. You don't care about grammar. You just write. Yeah. And then you you go through later and you narrow it down and then you narrow it down and you narrow it down." And uh, then sometimes if I can't narrow it down, then I'm like, okay, well, why don't I come up with a melody? If I have a meter, I can match words to a meter. And then that's kind of how I do it. Huh. Just let it all out. It's interesting how everybody writes songs different. And, Definitely. And does your writing style change? And, like, you talked about bringing on the drum machine made a big change to your music. It seems yes. like you're always trying to change your music. Well, because so. I hate depending on people. I've always hated depending on people. <laughs> I wish I could do everything myself. I really do. I can't. <laughs> And I hate it. <laughs> I like having...
having friends and family and I and loved ones and people in my life to support emotionally. I don't like depending on people to get something that done that I want to get done. I feel like a baby who can't walk yet or some oh. shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah. oh, I, just, I need to do it now, and you're just, you're asleep, and I need it now. <laughs> I wish I could do it. I wish I could Does do that it. That resembles it, um... <laughs> So what I so what I do is I try to minimize as many people as I need possible. So I do not want it to be to where I have to depend on people to write a song. So it's like, but sometimes hearing like coming up with a beat in my head and then hearing it out loud changes the song and then yeah. I change it to a different beat and then when I change that to a different beat um, it change it leads me to a different section which might lead me to a chorus that I didn't know about yet yeah and that's all from hearing these parts that I have in my head in in real life yeah and if I couldn't play the piano if I didn't have a drum machine and if I had to like schedule time with the drummer hey I need to hear what this beat sounds like on that you know how long it would take me to write a song it would yeah. take me like months man yeah. But now it takes like three days if I really focus. If if it's like these three days are reserved, phone's on airplane mode. I could write like probably four songs in three days. That's awesome. Because of how fast I can put in a part that I think sounds good and hear if it really sounds good or not. Because <laughs> it's like it just it's a fluid thing. You write one section and then that leads you to the next section. It's like musical mm -hmm. self awareness. Yeah, exactly. And I don't have to depend on anybody. <laughs> Well, speaking of not depending on anybody, we are dependent on some AC that we need to get on here for a second. Yes. So, once again, we want to say thank you so much for being here with us. We're about to have a song here with Jackie Vinson. This is Get On The Bus, presented by I Am AVL and Salvage Station. I'm your host, Caleb Calhoun. Hang out for one second. We'll be right back with a song. This is Get On The Bus, presented by Salvage Station. I Am AVL. We're here with Jackie Vinson. I'm your host, Caleb Calhoun. She's going to play a song for us called Run.
Jackie Vincent! <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for watching Get on the Bus, presented by Salvage Station IMAVL. I'm Caleb Calhoun. That's Jackie Vincent. Yep. Check her out. Go <laughs> listen to her music on Spotify and on iTunes and anywhere else that you can find good music. Yes, please. Yeah.